So the equity premium puzzle looks like, like a pretty big problem deep at the heart of our, uh, of our model. And in fact, we'll, we'll use that as the springboard for looking at modifications of the consumption-based model that will hopefully work better and give us a better tie uh, of macroeconomics to finance. We can see those correlations of finance and macroeconomics. We just need models to help us understand what's going on. Why are people so scared of stocks, especially in recessions and less so in booms? First, though, a, a couple comments on the whole equity premium thing. Why did it take finance so long to notice? Uh, finance went on for years before the equity premium puzzle was discovered, and this seems like a pretty big problem at the root of finance. Now, remember, uh, expected returns is covariance of returns with consumption growth times the risk aversion coefficient. What we do in finance is we multiply and divide by the variance of consumption growth and express that as beta times lambda. Now, financial applications seem to be very happy when expected returns line up with betas, and they treat the lambda, the market price of risk, as a free parameter. Well, the equity premium puzzle is precisely about the economics of lambda. Expected returns can line up with betas just fine. The equity premium puzzle points out that lambda, gamma, variance of consumption growth, lambda is too big relative to the variance of consumption growth. And you have to look at consumption growth to notice that. You can't see that puzzle if you just look at asset prices. Put another way, the capital asset pricing model, uh, how did we derive that? Reminder, we substitute out consumption equals the market return. Expected returns then are linear in market betas. The capital asset pricing model has no problem at all if consumption growth is 20% volatile. Look at the assumption. Consumption growth equals return on the market. The capital asset pricing model predicts, among other things, that the market return should have the same variance of consumption growth. There's no problem at all if consumption growth were as volatile as market returns. You have to see consumption growth to notice you need a terribly high risk aversion coefficient in the capital asset pricing model. Third, what else does finance do? Portfolio calculations. The standard portfolio calculation says that the weight on the risky asset should be related to risk aversion coefficient mean over variance of excess return. If you work that out, it seems to work just fine. Six over 18 I used here, uh, a risk aversion of co coefficient of three, that implies the usual 60-40 rule for portfolios. So finance said, great, uh, our, our theory's working fine. But that theory also says that consumption growth should equal the rate of return on the portfolio, uh, and that, that prediction of the theory got ignored. You have to look at the consumption growth to notice you have a problem. This is about the link between macro and finance not about finance itself. The puzzle, the deep puzzle, is why is the market price of risk so high, given that our economy seems to be so safe? One to two percent consumption growth volatility doesn't line up with 20 percent returns. Why do returns vary so much more than consumption growth? That's another way of stating the puzzle. Now, I do want to say there is some hope in recent research for the power utility model. We tend to give up on it. One, one question for you, thinking through the future, how high is the mean stock return really? Uh, one point, the data that we've seen, to what extent is the observed premium uh, luck or selection bias? Notice that the standard sigma over root t, mean returns on the stock market are very poorly measured. Uh, in 50 years, sort of the standard numbers say that we only know it to plus or minus 2.5 percentage points. Uh, in 20 years of data, we only know the mean return to 10 percentage points. That, that's bigger than the actual mean return. You look across countries, the U.S. has the highest equity premium of all the other countries. Well, maybe the U.S. got lucky. Uh, the big question is, will we see 6 to 8 percent mean return going forward? Did, did your grandparents uh, at the end of World War II know that, uh, that they, there would be an 8 percent return on stocks and they were just too scared of the risk? Or was some of that, in fact, a lot of good luck? Perhaps the true equity premium is a lot lower. Long-run returns uh, depend on economic growth. This is the long-run return decomposition. When you look at very long-run returns, initial and final prices don't really matter. What matters is long-run economic growth. In the long run, the long-run return is the long-run growth of dividends. So another way of, of putting the puzzle, uh, did your grandparents or great-grandparents really know that the post-war period would have the highest economic growth of all human history, or was that to some extent a surprise? Will we have the same economic growth in the future? Similarly, uh, the rare disasters literature 
uh, says that the historical statistics we're looking at were, uh, were misleading, maybe the true uh, standard deviation of consumption growth is a lot bigger. Uh, rather than thinking that the, the mean of the equity premium is wrong, maybe really there's more risk out there. Uh, maybe people are worried about earthquakes that only come when it's once every hundred years or so, and that's what makes them afraid of stocks. Of course, when one can criticize anything like that, the, the dark matter criticism says, yeah, people are afraid of something you haven't seen. Uh, that can be unscientific if you're not careful about it. And in recent research, I think there is hope for the power utility model, at least in the very long run uh, as a foundation for it. Uh, by looking at longer horizons, by recognizing the higher correlation of stock returns and consumption growth, which occurs at longer horizons. Uh, stock returns and consumption aren't well correlated day to day or minute to minute, but yes, decade to decade, and better measurement. This is an example from uh, Jago and Athan and Wang, a uh, paper in the readings. Uh, they did the consumption-based model. They measured it December to December, Christmas shopping to Christmas shopping, and look at the nice uh, way that ex excess returns line up with the covariance with consumption growth in December to December data. As a comparison, there's the Fama French three-factor model. So that's how the Fama French model lines up. That's how the consumption-based model lines up. Pretty good, huh? There's hope at last if you measure things a little bit better. Uh, the, this is not a total success. Uh, this model, their model doesn't fit the risk-free rate. We're looking just at excess returns here. Their model still implies a very high risk aversion coefficient. They did the linear version of the model. Uh, but I think, especially in the long run, there is hope for the power utility model yet. However, where we're going is we're going to look at other utility functions. We're going to look at more deeply at the economics. The power utility function was just a, a toy function we started with. There's nothing deep about why that should work. Uh, so let's look at um, the economics of financial markets, the, economic, the links between macro uh, and finance, uh, other utility functions, other production functions, and, and, and uh, see how we can do this economic link better.